Okay, well, look, welcome to moth identification tips. Two, there's a lovely picture of a goat moth. What a fabulous species. It's something I've rarely seen as an adult, but occasionally see as a caterpillar, those enormous, shiny, kind of ugly, beetle-like looking caterpillars that are racing around over the ground, trying to find somewhere to be paid. But anyway, that's what this very primitive moth looks like as an adult dunner. Um, now, as a result of... Um, uh, one of the comments we had in the last session, I you know, clearly haven't covered all the books that could be covered, but for all of those of you starting your way into moths, then I have to say the Gateway Guide produced on British moths by James Lowen is really great. Um, it, this isn't going to baffle you in, you know, with, I don't know, two and a half thousand species of moth. James has picked 350 most eye-catching, most interesting species and has given some really, really good photographs of those, a bit of text, and has done what I've done, but I'm doing with the pen, the digital pen. He pointed to key features that will help you identify those species. So this is a book. It's a Fairly recently out, a uh, fairly recently published book. Was it last year? Maybe, maybe it's been out a little bit longer than that. Um, but a really, really good book and a good read too. So um, James, as you may know, is um, over in Norfolk, and and um, a well-known recorder in that part of the world. He's also a brilliant travel writer and all the rest of it. So all round polymath. Um, so there's his book, and I would recommend it. Right, we're going to crack on now, and we're going to start straight in with kitten moths, because kitten moths, um, I don't know, I've, I sometimes struggle to identify these, to get these correctly identified. And there are three species we've got in this country, sallow, poplar, and alder kitten. And um, the sallow and the alder kitten do look very similar. Sorry, the sallow and the poplar kitten do look very similar, and the alder kitten really likely different. In terms of their distribution, sallow kitten is pretty much uh, throughout the whole of the country. And in, it is quite rare in Ireland. There are more records in Northern Ireland than, than the Republic, but it's, but it's around. The kitten is pretty much England and Wales. Um, it's not really a southwestern and a western species. So if you're down in Devon and Cornwall, it's rare. And if you're in most of Wales, it's rare. Um, and it gets about as far north as northern England, but it's pretty scarce up there too. Older kitten have got a most peculiar distribution. It's got a sort of a Surrey, Sussex, uh, Burt Woodland distribution there. It's in Norfolk, and it's a southwesterly species. But there's this whole slug of central England from central southern England all the way up into Yorkshire where this moth just doesn't occur. And yet... You go into Derbyshire and it's on the hill slopes, on the moorland hill slopes where there's birch growing openly on those moorland hill slopes, then you find it up there. So it's a, a really peculiar. And you, you get up into um, Gate Barrows in Lancashire, and that's about as far north as that one gets. So how to tell um, older kitten from the others? Let's just do my pen now. Point of options, highlighter. Now let's just see if this works. It does, but I just need to change the color. I'm just using a slightly different technique to get the pen working. Sorry about this. Uh, point of options, ink color, and red. Right, and now we will be able to... So if you look at this central bar here in the older kitten, the older kitten is a much darker bar than, than how the uh, sallow and the pop kitten. And if you look at the margins of that dark bar, you can't really see the margins. The whole thing is really a sort of peppery, peppery black color. And if you compare that with the central bar on the sallow and the kitten, you will see that they have got uh, particularly dark margins to it. So older kitten is relatively straightforward to identify and um, and. You, sh you shouldn't have a great deal of problem. It tends to be a relatively rare species, 
Um, I, I don't know that it ever turns up in good numbers. I suppose somebody will say, oh, yes, I do find it in Derbyshire in half a dozen in a trap in the morning. But in my experience in Dorset, um, I've seen it just a handful of times, but I know it's around. It's around at low density, and I presume it just doesn't come to light particularly well. Right, let's go back to concentrating on the fallow and the, the kittens. Um, there are my my hunch is that that in in our desire to record poplar kitten wherever we are, in our gardens or nature reserves or whatever, there is a tendency to over record this species. Not so much, not so much um early on in the summer, but certainly later on, and I'll tell you why that is. There are some key features that most books describe, and and one of those on the, the kitten is this particularly strong uh, outer margin of the grey bar, this sort of black line, the outer margin of the grey bar. And if you compare that with a similar sallow kitten, it's usually a much weaker affair and often rather wiggly. But not always. So if you look at the top left sallow kitten, you can see, hmm, that looks to me like quite a strong bar, but it is actually sallow kitten. And there's something about the angle of that bar, perhaps. But I think if you were to see an individual sitting in a moth trap, I think you might struggle to go, well, is that really a poplar kitten or a sallow kitten? Well, there are some things we can do to help us out with that. Um, so let's just erase all that ink. Um, I think one thing that, for those of you who are looking carefully, if you look at those poplar kittens in a row, what do you notice about them? Particularly the bottom two. They've got extremely long forewings, and that is a key difference between that and sallow kitten. Quite difficult if you've only got one individual. But anyway, let's just see where we go with this. Let's look at some set examples and the Top row are sallow kittens, and the bottom row are kittens. And that tells you something about how to distinguish these two species. Or, or, you know, the sallow kitten, the male and the female, are almost always much smaller than the poplar kitten. They are not the same sized moth. And if you look at the male sallow kitten and compare that with the male the kitten, you can see just how long and pointed the wing is of the male the kitten. Okay, and I think that that's a really characteristic. When you see a poplar kitten sitting in a moth trap, you go, crikey, look at those long pointed wings. And I feel the male sallow kitten is just that bit more rounded wing. Hop over to the female sallow and the female poplar on the right hand side, and you'll see just how much bigger female poplar kitten is than the sallow kitten. And so you're looking for something that is female poplar kitten is frankly outsized. It's not it's not really approaching a puss moth, but it is certainly a very big moth indeed and will strike you as that in your moth where or wherever you see it. But there are some other little things that we need to just help us on our way here. So first thing is how do I know whether I've got a male or a female. Well, the male sallow kitten, the male poplar kitten have got ectinated antennae, these feathered antennae, particularly in the lower section of the antenna, where in the female, you can see it's, yeah, there are some very slight um, uh, ectinations on it, but it's, but it's all rather, um, it's all rather muted. They're very short. So we don't need to worry too much about them. Just if you can tell whether you've got a male or a female, that's really, really helpful. Um, the next thing to, to think about is in the male the kitten, you look at the hind wing. And if you look at the hind wing here, you can see that there is no gray bar as there is in the sallow kitten. Now, I know somebody's going to whiz straight onto Lepiforum and say, ah, but there are poplar kittens shown on the German website which have got grey bars. Absolutely right. This character seems to work for the British populations of poplar kittens. Is that 
I don't say it's an absolute, but I'm sure there will be poplar kittens with a, a greyish bar running through the hind wing. But if you've got a, a kitten moth, which is a male that has a bright white hind wing without the shadow of a doubt, clear white, no, no greyish bar, then that is almost certain to be poplar kitten male. OK, but this does not work with the female. And in fact, we can see that on, on this female kitten on the right hand side. OK, so that's the that's that's a, a key feature for the um, identification of male. I went to my little thing we go. Erase all the ink. However, there's just one other little thing that we need to think about, and that is the dimensions of the, the moths. I've said it's a much bigger uh, 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 moth, the poplar kitten, than the sallow kitten. And so here I've provided you with the dimensions that you're looking at. Now, I'm using the term wing length here. If you look at uh, other texts, you might see wing span. And I prefer wing length just because Wing length means the length from the join where it joins into the oh, where it joins into the, um, the, the the thorax out to the apex of the wing. That's the wing length to there. Okay, uh, wing span is twice that, as in it's both wings. Out there. It's it's definitely not that. Okay, so a wing length is is from the base of the wing to the apex of the wing. And if you look at those dimensions, you will see quite clearly in sallow kitten how much um, smaller it is than the poplar kitten, and the same for the female. And look at the size of the female poplar kitten. It's enormous in comparison with the others. So um, what tends to happen is that in the second generation of sallow kittens, Somehow, I don't know, that, that the markings seem to be stronger in that second generation than they are in the first generation. And quite often, some of the markings on the female fallow kitten do not look a bit like poplar kitten. But if you look at the wing dimensions, there really is no overlap between those two species. There's a real clear distinction. And to find a female poplar kitten, it's a very big moth indeed. The last thing I'd put in there is the time of year of appearance. Um, now, that's just, just a little bit controversial. That's my view. And I know some others will turn straight to, oh, I don't know, to, to um, um, the, the, the Butterfly Conservation um, Atlas. And, and you'll see that for the kitten, it's saying now regularly does a second generation late in the summer. Well, we're down in Dorset here. And in 20 years, I have seen two second generation opera kittens. It may do uh, a second generation more frequently somewhere else, but it certainly doesn't do it here. So those times of year very much rate, relate to where I am here in, in Dorset. So the first sallow kittens are appearing in late April and going on till June. And then at some point in July, probably around mid-July and through August, we get a second generation. The first poplar kittens that I, as the county moth recorder, am happy to accept, frankly, don't really start turning up until late May, and then they're going on to the beginning of July. And only very, very occasionally towards the end of August is there ever found to be another example. Now, that may not hold true in your area, but that's certainly how it is here. And it's certainly how the reporters in Dorset are now kind of checking out whether they do or don't have the... Uh, the kittens um, in their midst. So I think we probably just erase all the ink on that slide. And I think we're done on the kittens now. Right. The next bunch of species we're going to look at are some of these carpets. And um, the very sad thing is that, that the um, um, dark barred twin spot carpet has now become a much, much rarer species. The top two species, dark barred twin spot carpet and red twin spot carpet, used to be ubiquitous and pretty much abundant throughout the whole country. And I'll deal with the bottom one, balsam carpet, in a minute. Um, 
But uh, I don't know, in the last 20 to 30 years, that bud twin spot carpet has dwindled. Not everywhere. There are still good populations scattered around the country. But I heard last year, for instance, that dark barred twin spot carpet has now been declared extinct in Hertfordshire. Um, no, no examples that have been confirmed have turned up in Hertfordshire now for more than five years. Doesn't mean to say they won't turn up again, but they have become very rare. And in Dorset, where I am, the, the, the places where it turns up most regularly and in small numbers are right in the east of the county in Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, and really the far east of that, more, more to do with Christchurch than, than even in Bournemouth. Whereas red twin spot carpet remains a very common moth all over the county. Right, but I'm just going to uh, deal with balsam carpet first. Let me just get to my little rib notes for that, if that's okay. Um, just so I give you some half reasonable information. Um, balsam carpet at the bottom. How do we distinguish balsam carpet from red twin spot carpet? Well, the the key feature to look for is is the uh, the, the the outer margin of the dark bar is relatively un unwiggly, so it hasn't got many little arches and wiggles in it. It's a relatively sort of straight. Um, yeah, a nice, fairly evenly smooth line beyond which is this white uh, white band which has a dark line through it. And it's a very distinct white band. There is a bit of a however is that the balsam carpet does have two generations a year. And in the spring generation shown at the top, the white band is much stronger, much more contrasting with the dark band next to it than it is in the summer generation. Now, balsam carpet, most of us don't have to worry about because it's not really a species that occurs in our area. Balsam carpet is a species that occurs in um, Southeast England and Central Southern England, stretching up um, uh, across to Norfolk. And the caterpillars live in particular on orange balsam, rather than, and I only wish they did live on Himalayan balsam, but as far as I'm aware, there aren't any records on Himalayan balsam. So we're going to have to look for it in areas where orange balsam grows on wet, it's kind of wet, muddy ditches and underneath uh, thick, dense stands of alder and, and on willow, uh, where you've got a sort of a muddy ground layer where the balsam tends to spread. Those are the sorts of areas where you can find balsam carpet and you can find the caterpillars on the undersides of the little balsam leaves. Right, now let's get back to our dark bar twin spot and red twin spot. How are we going to reliably tell these two species apart? Well, we could, for instance, just say, well, the dark bar twin spot has a dark bar and the red twin spot a red bar. And I think the two individuals on the left kind of show that. However, that top set individual is actually of the, uh, on the, on the right-hand side, is actually of the red form of the dark barred twin spot carpet. So if you compare top right with middle left, you can see that the bar there, you know, they're not a dissimilar color. It's certainly not, it's certainly not blackish. Um, and um, and so there are forms of dark barred twin spot which have got a very similar reddish color to red twin spot. So that's not a not a reliable feature, although it's a very helpful feature because red twin spot carpet doesn't have a black bar. So it can be it can be helpful, but you need to know in which direction that's helpful. Right. Let's let's get on to the key features then. Now these key features. I see. I would say need to be all of the key features need to be found on your examples in order to match to be able to record with certainty dark barred twin spot carpet. If you've only got one of them, then well, you might have or you might not. But I like I, I like as a county recorder to look for all three features which I'm about to describe. The first is the uh the the surroundings to the twin spot so here's the twin spot on the dark bud twin spot carpet you see here the two dark spots 
and they are surrounded by pale gray or gray, mid gray. What that gray is, it doesn't have a load of other stuff going on it. And you compare that with the um, red twin spot carpet and you'll see that there's a, a wiggly white line running to the outer margin of the dark uh, two dots. And there's some brownish color and a bit of gray. It's a right, it's a right old mix of stuff. So the red twin spot carpet has got plenty going on in there, whereas the dark blood twin spot is two dark spots in an otherwise relatively plain ground. That's the first feature. The second feature just coming in is the margin of the dark bar, the outer margin, which if you look at the, the angle of that margin, you can watch, watch my, my kind of free hand as I'm going. You can see just how much, how well angled that is. Now let's just compare that if, if my free hand's going well. And let's just see how that does. Okay. And what you can see is actually there's a, the, the, the bar ends up looking broader. It is broader because uh, where that first angle coming up from the trailing edge of the wing breaks and goes out, you've got quite an extension out in towards the, towards the outer edge of the wing before it turns back in. So you end up in the middle of the wing with the dark large twin spot carpet having a broader band. So that's why the band looks broader. So there's your second feature for the dark bar twin spot. The third feature, and this third feature sometimes does occur on the red twin spot carpet. And that's why I say you cannot realistically record this feature on the basis of just that feature alone. And that's the, the very sharp angle that there is just before the leading edge of the wing in the dark bar twin spot carpet. It's, it's got a very sharp notch, okay? And if you compare that with the knot there is in the red twin spot carpet, oh look, it's much shallower. So if you've got all three characters, whether it's a red bar or a dark bar, then you have got a dark bar twin spot carpet. If you've only got one of those, well, do take a photograph with, of it, share it on social media, get opinions of others, because these species are not easy to do. And I dread to think how many times as a youngster growing up, I've misidentified them. But I hope now that I'm getting them right in my uh, later years. So that's how to do dark barred and red twin spot carpet. So um, I think uh, dark barred twin spot carpet is oft over recorded because of, uh, you know, of a sort of lack of understanding of, of, of the need for numbers of characters to align before you can confidently record it. Right, there we go. Okay, let's see where we're moving on to now. Yes, just having a very quick look at the other twin spot carpets. Large twin spot carpet, twin spot carpet, and striped twin spot carpet. Now, the only one that's closely related to red twin spot, dark bar twin spot, is large twin spot carpet. And large twin spot carpet, again, this is a species that well, it certainly doesn't come into my area down in Weymouth. That there, there, there's perhaps the odd Dorset record, but it's much uh, a central southern England heading up into the Midlands and points eastward. It, it gets up into Yorkshire, but it's basically an eastern species in Britain. Um, and um, it's a much bigger moth. Um, if you look at the outer, beyond the outer margin of the dark bar, you can see that it's got some rich brown colors and, and, and dark wavy lines in there. You know, you're not going to overlook a large twin spot carpet, and it's a very magnificent moth when it turns up. Twin spot carpet, on the other hand, twin spot carpet is is it's more of a rivulet um, than it is a twin spot carpet. Um, and it it tends to be more of a northern species. So if you want to see this in abundance, then you'll have to go to my favourite spot, spot for mothing in the country, which is obviously Scotland, uh, where the species is super abundant on, on moorlands, particularly the, with labouring moorlands. Um, where the caterpillars are all over the place and the moths are flying around. The further south you go, I think it tends to be a more local species. And there are a few woodlands in Dorset where this moth occurs um, and uh, is worth looking out for. But it, it's... Um, 
you can see just how very different it is. It hasn't, it's got a central bar, but it's, it's very definitely not a central bar that stands out on its own. The other one, striped quinspot carpet, is a moorland species, and, and uh, so it's pretty much restricted to that area. Right, let's get on with some other carpets because we're having fun with those. Um, here are five species of carpet. Um, clearly the one on the right, the small argent and sable, I don't think is one that uh, we're easily going to uh, uh, conf confuse with anything else. Um, uh, not the least of which is when you see a small argent and sable, it is rarely sitting as it is in that picture. Normally, you'll see it by day out on moorlands, uh, anywhere from southwest England all the way up. And again, this species starts getting much commoner in Scotland. Um, and they sit like a, like a butterfly. They, uh, uh, so they sit with their wings kind of angled out, uh, um, ready to fly. And, and uh, the, the other carpets tend not to do that. So um, it's a much more black and white species, hence the name Argent and Sable. So back to the other four, garden carpet, galien carpet, common carpet, and wood carpet. I think we can all recognize garden carpet. Garden carpet is a pretty common moth. Just very occasionally, garden carpet has um, an almost complete central bar. You can see in this example how the bar actually stops halfway down the wing towards the trailing edge. Um, but just occasionally something will be a bit a bit more uh, a bit fuller than that and extend all the way down to to the trailing edge. In which case it starts to look a little bit like gallium carpet or gallium carpet, depending on if you wish to pronounce it. But um, gallium carpet really does have this jet black or very dark brown central bar. And there's something, if you look at the wing shape of a gallium carpet, it looks slightly longer winged, doesn't it? And that is because it is slightly longer winged, but it's also got another key character. It doesn't show very well on this first example, but the next one does. And that is that the leading edge of the gallium carpet wing is almost always dipped, it's slightly convex. Do you see here from the apex how it's just slightly dipped? Well, it's a bit over exaggerated there. Whereas it's very straight in the garden carpet. So you've got a slight imagination on the on, on the leading edge of the gallium carpet wing. And with that and a, and a really quite a long wing, um, you can tell gallium from garden carpet. Gallium carpet remains a um, pretty common species in coastal grasslands. Um, and it used to be pretty common and widespread on inland uh, chalk downlands um, but has very, very much declined. It's still out in Norfolk, I think that's right, Norfolk. Um, uh, but it's, but it's, uh, yes, the Norfolk coast. But otherwise, it's pretty much a coastal thing. It's through, it's throughout quite a lot of Wales, um, and it, it stretches up well into northern England, but I think, and just a little bit into the, into Speyside, into Strath Spey. So it, it's a very much a rare species. Um, outside of kind of the coastal areas in the south and the west. So if you do see gallium carpet, it's well worth recording because it's uh, it's one of those species that ought really to be spreading back in to our habitats as, please, please, we actually managed to restore them to something rather better. So it should be a species that should be coming back into our downlands. Right, let's flip on to common carpet and wood carpet. Common carpet, again, I think we can mostly recognize common carpet, but I bet, and I have too, and I've been, you know, am I over-recording common carpet and missing wood carpet? Wood carpet is a bigger moth than common carpet, and by and large, it has a single generation in a year. So wood carpet is going to be appearing in, in um, uh, um, May, uh, June time, and, and common carpet will be out in May, and, and keeping going for uh, wood carpet, May to May to August for, for wood carpet, and common carpet is certainly sort of April to September into pretty much two generations. But what about the key features? Well, wood carpet is slightly bigger, but if you look at wood carpet, and particular the, the white band beyond the 
outer margin of the center bar, that white band is broad and almost entirely white. And it extends, and I've deliberately drawn my red pen through into the hind wing, it extends into the hind wing, this white band extends as nearly pure white. It's not absolute, but it's nearly pure white. If you compare that to the to the band that's on the common carpet, you can see that there is a distinct, even if slightly broken, ray line through that white band. So it's a it's a bigger moth. It's got this distinct white band. The other thing is a bit difficult on the photographs, but the band of the wood carpet has basically got a lot more brown in it. And particularly if you've got a fresh example sat in a in a pot, that that brown almost glints when you've got it in the in the in a nice fresh daylight. So the wood carpet looks a, a, a browner a, a browner moth. But just as a word of warning, because it's happened to me, and it's happened to me not not that long ago, is I thought I'd recorded wood carpet um, in in the Channel Islands. I'd found a female common carpet, and she seemed to have a very very white outer band. And I thought, good heavens, that's a wood carpet on the channel lines, which would be an exceptional record. And uh, I got a few eggs from her and I reared them on. And they all turned out to be common carpets. So all I can say is just be careful. Um, if you're not sure, and it's perfectly fine to be not sure, is that check with others to see whether you are finding wood carpet. But it is, it's a bigger moth. Um, than, than the common carpet. Right. Okay. Let's raising. Next, next picture species. Right. We're now going to deal with broken barred carpet, small phoenix, water carpet, and Devon carpet. Um, I, I, I don't, you know, the, the first two, broken barred carpet and small phoenix, I don't think they're a particular problem. It's just they're. Um, I think we think that the broken bar carpet is always going to have a broken bar. The broken bar being the the, the sort of white line between the cent uh, that cuts across the central dark bar. Um, so that's often the case, but just occasionally it's joined together. You can see in the in the uh, specimen below the top one, and in the bottom one, you can if you look at the difference between the the top specimen and the bottom specimen, and no prices for guessing where that bottom one comes from, that's from Scotland. Um, the broken barred carpets in Scotland are kind of a really dark gray brown with this silver, silvery white uh, markings all over. They look quite a different moth from the, uh, from the top two, which are uh, examples of broken barred carpet from England. So um, yet another example of of how Scotland is just so amazing and different from the rest of the country. Um, small Phoenix, I think, is fine, but you can see how Small Phoenix also has a broken bar. Don't be beguiled by the name that everything with a broken bar isn't just a broken bar carpet. The Small Phoenix, which sticks its abdomen up uh, out of its wings, is also going to have that broken bar. Right, let's move on to Water Carpet and Devon Carpet. Um, Water carpet, I think when I was a young lad, a water carpet would be a relatively widespread species and Devon carpet had barely been recorded. Um, it was certainly around in the southwest but uh, and a tiny bit in Hampshire, but realistically it was a very rare moth indeed. That has all changed. Devon carpet is spreading like mad and it's spreading up from the southwest and is heading 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 very definitely northwards. That certainly gets up into north uh, North Lancashire and just into Cumbria. It's widespread in Wales. It's certainly over to Hampshire. Um, and it's just about spreading into the Midlands. So how are we going to tell water carpet from, from Devon carpet? Firstly, time of year is the water carpet is out is um, April into May. Devon carpet is May into June. Water carpet is bigger than Devon carpet. Okay, but when you've only got one individual, quite difficult to tell the two apart. The one key feature that I really like is just look at the way that moth or those two moths are sitting. Can you see here the, um, the outer edge of the water carpet is quite a nice even curve. And if we look at the 
outer edge of the Devon carpet, we'll see it's like a bowl. It's kind of dished. It's um, it's 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 got a nice curve to it. So I think when you look at a Devon carpet, you say, oh, it's quite rounded winged. And I think that's the difference. The Devon carpet is a smaller, neater, more rounded winged species than than um, water carpet. So let me just get rid of those little annotations. Um, and there's another example of a, of a Devon carpet looking very much more like a water carpet. And remember, look at the outer edge of the wing and you can see just how much that outer edge curves back into the, uh, into the body to make it a very rounded looking moth. If you were to concentrate on the four wing characters though, I think you'd go, oh, it's a bit tricky. You know, what are my key features that, that in, in, the, in the overall lovely looking silvery white marks and the browns and the shadings, how am I going to be able to tell those apart? Well, from the four wings, I would say you need to look at the underside of the four wings. So get it in your plastic box and photograph it from the underside. Let's just have well, oh yeah, one more slide. There, there's this nice curved look of the um, Devon carpet as opposed to the rather straighter, gentle curve in the um, water carpet. Okay, just get rid of those. Um, so let's look at these undersides um, because they are, um, that, that's, that's where this, the, 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 the characters become a bit more obvious. First up is the underside of the water carpet almost always has these strong uh, white dots uh, inwardly edged with uh, black marks. Not always, but, but almost always. And you can see the same is not quite true. It's got some vague markings in the underside of the Devon carpet, but not particularly. The other good feature is if you follow down what is the, the outer margin of the dark bar, you can see that it's very sharply indented part way from the leading edge down towards the trailing edge, where in the Devon carpet, it's a bit wiggly but it's pretty straight. And that, so if I'm ever confused, turn it over and have a look at the underside of the four-wing. And you should be able to get Devon carpet and water carpet spot on every time. And probably coming to a place near you. I, my guess is that uh, Devon carpet will end up being a, a widespread species you know, across the country at some point or other. I don't know when. Just before we leave this, Let's just have a look at the underside of small phoenix. Having shown you those characters for uh, Devon carpet and water carpet, let's just have a look at the equivalent. And for those of you who uh, are seasoned mothers, you will know just how difficult it is and how long you have to wait for a small phoenix to sit beautifully so you can photograph it. It has to be in the fridge for a few hours before it goes, no, all right, I won't sit like a butterfly. I will sit with my wings down. If it is sitting with the wings up, then you can see from the underside of the forewing just how wonderfully wiggly that outer line is. So it's ref there's, if you look at the forewing on the top side, you can see these black tooth marks, and those are replicated on the underside, and they're even more pronounced than those black tooth marks. So that is a good way of being able to identify a small phoenix, even if he or she won't show the forewings. Right. Okay, where are we going next? Right. Pine carpet, grey pine carpet, spruce carpet, fir carpet, juniper carpet, all of that lot. Okay, so here's a here's a um, pretty widespread group of species that uh, most of us will encounter from time to time, and we'll all want to do our level best to get them correctly identified. I'm just going to get to my Trib in the book for the distributions because surprise, surprise, I can't remember them completely. Um, right, here we go. So on the left, we have pine carpet, and pine carpet is this lovely orangey brown mixed gray carpet moth. 
gray pine carpet, as the name suggests, if we look too along, is um, uh, genuinely gray and brown. But in the middle, we can see a form of the gray pine carpet, which is reddish brown and doesn't half look like pine carpet. So there has to be a way of us being able to distinguish pine carpet from gray pine carpet, and particularly the orangey brown form of gray pine carpet. And it all comes down to the angle you can see on the inner margin of that dark brown bar. So there is the inner angle. And if you look at the example that I've just blown up, so the enlarged below, you can see just how sharply angulated that inner margin is. Okay, really, really sharply angulated. And and it's it's a definite V-notch in that inner margin. Look at the equivalent on the uh, reddish form of the um, gray pine carpet, and it's just not as it's just not as strong. It's not as deeply indented. Um, and indeed, on other forms of gray pine carpet, you'll see that the it's it's not indented at all. It's an obtuse angle. So there will be occasions when you'll be going, oh, is that gray pine or is it pine carpet? Oh, we're not really quite sure. Worry not, even if you're undecided on the, uh, the angle of that inner margin, and most of them, it, most of them are very obvious indeed. Once you've got that character into your head, then you can also look at the underside of the hind wing. Oh, let me just get rid of those markings because that's not very helpful. Um, okay, the underside of the hind wing. You can see there's um, on the underside of the hind wing that there is a, a curved dark line in the middle of the wing. And if you look at this curved dark line in pine carpet, it's just a nice smooth curve. And then it's got a kink down here. If you look at the same on gray pine carpet, it's got an angle for the leading edge of the hind wing. And then it kinks down there again. So there is a uh, there's a marking difference on the underside of the hind wing between pine carpet and gray pine carpet. So that's also very helpful, I think, to be able to distinguish the two species. So what about distinguishing gray pine carpet, pine carpet from spruce carpet? Well, I've certainly made mistakes in the past, and hopefully I will, won't be doing that again. Spruce carpet always has some kind of whitish, distinctly contrasting whitish margin to the dark central band, particularly on the outer margin of that dark band, but often it's much more extensive. So the three examples there I've got of spruce carpet, you can see are really quite contrasting, you know, grayish white with a dark gray brown center band. That's the way to, to, to pick out your spruce carpet is they're often quite contrasting. That bottom one is a bit more tricky, but it still has that nice white line on the outer margin of the dark bar. Um, so that's that's a surefire way of being able to separate the uh, spruce carpet from those others. Right, but what about some of these others? For those of you who rely on your first edition of Waring and Townsend, and I think possibly even the second edition of Waring and Townsend, you will see that the cypress carpet isn't a species that's at all figured in in um, uh, the book because it was it first arrived in this country in in the mid 1980s, and it's now relatively widespread in southern England and has spread into southern Wales. So it's now a species that's very much on our books. It's associated with cypress trees, various sorts of cypress trees, particularly um, a Monterey cypress. And, and it turns up you know, regularly throughout Dorset. Uh, lots of people are recording it, but we haven't half got quite a lot of juniper carpet records from the late 1980s because nobody knew how to record cypress carpet because they didn't know what it was. It wasn't in the book. But cypress carpet is definitely around. It's a bigger moth, so it's the size of a pine carpet, a gray pine carpet. And it, and the characteristic, it's got a, almost always three black flecks diagonally 
placed from the apex of the wing leading down towards the middle of the wing. So uh, and when you see that, you go, oh yeah, that's got to be in Cyprus carpet. Next door, I put two examples of juniper carpet. Juniper carpet has a single generation a year and appears very late in the year in October and November. Okay, and guess where that lower specimen is coming from. It's come from uh, Scotland, where juniper carpet is just so much more beautiful. Uh, juniper carpet in central and northern England tends to be a, more associated with urban environments. Um, and uh, But it is, you know, where there's native juniper occurring, then it will also be there. And juniper carpet comes all the way down into southern England, but in its southern England distribution, in my experience, tends to be more associated with where native common juniper grows on the downlands rather than in urban areas. Just occasionally um, it will it will turn up in an urban area. But it's a very, very late flying species and it's rather small. <laughs> Next door to that is chestnut coloured carpet. And chestnut coloured carpet is um, a, a very local species. Um, it's pretty much... Um, uh, something for the highlands of Scotland. Um, it, it's it's around in North Lancashire, um, in in uh, on the, uh, the hills of North Lancashire and into Cumbria, where we've got um, the limestone outcrops with juniper. Um, it's there, and it's also uh, reasonably widespread on the coast from Northern Ireland, heading down to the Burren. And in the Burren, on the limestone pavement where juniper is abundant, there are a lot of chestnut-coloured carpets. Otherwise, chestnut colour carpet doesn't occur. I mean, as far as I'm aware, was it sud South Southern Wales? I think there may be one or two accepted records, but otherwise it's it's a species of the, of the North and, and the Far West. The other one that's worth keeping an eye out for is fur carpet. I think there have been somewhere around half a dozen records that have turned up, and I think they're almost always in the autumn, probably as an immigrant species. But if you look next door at blue border carpet, which is a magnificent little moth. If you thought that you found an aberration of blue border carpet that looked a bit grayer and browner, maybe it's a fur carpet because they don't ask look similar. Um, but fur carpet is a southern European species that is probably spreading slightly further north these days, and we're just catching the odd overspill. But who knows in the next 10 or so years might be something that we start seeing quite regularly in southern England. So if you've got a one of these pine carpet-like moths that looks a bit like blue border carpet, please please take a photograph of it and post photograph of it and post it because you may well have fur carpet. Right, how are we doing time-wise? We're okay. Um, common marble carpet and dark marble carpet. Here's where life gets a wee bit complicated. Uh, these two species in northern England and in Scotland are super common, particularly on the moorlands, and they fly pretty much together in July and August. Um, and they are, well, I have to say, I think they're really hard to distinguish, particularly in the field where they're buzzing around fast over the moorlands. Um, the one that in southern England, um, certainly the common marble carpet is a species that it, it has got a really spread out emergence. So we should be finding common marble carpet probably starting in some point in April, and we'll probably still see the odd one well into November. If there is one form of the common marble carpet that never occurs, well, hard to say never, isn't it? But as far as I know, doesn't occur in dark marble carpet. It's this form here on the right-hand side with the nice brown, pale brown, orangey brown mark in the wing. That's very definitely going to be common marble carpet. But otherwise, in southern England, dark marble carpet, so that's the lower ones, is, is a pretty local species. It's um, in Dorset, it's pretty much only a woodland species and occurs in July and August, often right at the end of July and in the first two weeks of August. So it's got a very restricted time period when it appears, whereas the common marble carpet is much more widespread throughout the year. So how are we going to distinguish these two, and particularly if they're up in Scotland? Well, the thing we need to do is to, oh, well, I'll leave it there, is to look at the underside of 
both wings. Let's just get rid of that for a sec. Um, find the option. Is the underside of both the hind wing and the forewing. Let's take the hind wing first of all. Is that the hind wing of the um, common marble carpet has basically one really well marked wiggly line, and that wiggly line has curves about halfway down it, but it's not as angled as a curve on the dark marbled carpet. The other thing about the dark marble carpet is it has just raise all the it has three lines on it. And you can see in almost all examples, I'm sure there are some which don't, but almost all examples in the hind wing have three lines, dark lines, where that's much more difficult to make out in the common marble carpet. So that's the first character to look at, but don't rely entirely on that. The next character is on the forewing, and that's the angle of this white mark runs down from the leading edge of the wing. You can see that angle there and compare that with the angle of one in the dark marble carpet. And you see it is at a sharper angle. It's a steeper angle in the in the uh, common marble carpet than it is. It's a shallower angle in the dark marble carpet. So um, if you've got a shallow angle with this white pale mark and three lines, it's going to be a dark marble carpet. And if you've got basically one wiggly line in the hind wing and a, and a sharper angle, then it will be common marble carpet. Now, somebody's going to say, well, what about the Aran carpet, Phil? The Aran carpet, well, is a bit of a mix of the two, yeah. It's a, it's a race of the common marble carpet that occurs in the far west of Scotland on the Isle of Arran and on the inner and outer Hebrides. And it occurs in July and August. And it is flying with dark marble carpet at the same time. And they are quite difficult to tell apart. But the, the wiggle on the, uh, the, the wiggly line on the hind wing is probably the easiest way to tell them apart. Um, the, so July and August for the Aran carpet. So if you're out in the in the Hebrides then and on, on Aran, then then you know you need to be careful about which species you're going to record. It's not something I'm massively experienced in, but um but, uh, uh, you know check the check the East of Scotland Butterfly Conservation website for photos and records to make sure you're getting the best opportunity to record that race of the common marble carpet. Okay, we'll keep going for a little bit longer. Yes, that ribbon wave, plain wave, and Portland ribbon wave. Um, I think had it been a few years ago, I might not have bothered with Portland ribbon wave because, well, Portland ribbon wave, as the name suggests, as, uh, is a species that's been found on Portland for a very long time. The first record of Portland Ribbon Wave was 1831. And the moth has remained pretty much steadfast, pretty much only on Portland for the following 150 years. And then it started turning up a little bit at St. Oldham's Head, heading down the coast towards, um, towards Swanage. And then all of a sudden, Portland Ribbon Wave, and certainly in the last five to ten years, has started turning up all the way along the south coast. But there's a difference between the Portland Ribbon Wave that originated on Portland from the Portland Ribbon Wave that is now invading from continental Europe. And that is the Portland Ribbon Wave, as we're on Portland, one generation a year, almost always during July, perhaps very slightly into August. Now we see Portland Ribbon Wave turning up on the south coast from, oh, I think there are even examples at the end of May, but certainly June until September, even sometimes October. And it's undoubtedly now breeding in lots of places along the south coast of England. And I think it's almost certain that this continental race, variety, whatever it is, uh, two generation a year will spread inland. For those of you who regularly go over to France, you will have seen Portland Ribbon Wave being an abundant moth 
all over the place. And my guess is that's coming to a place near you soon. So worth thinking that you might actually find Portland Ribbon Way away from the south coast of England anytime soon. And the easiest way to distinguish it is it does have this dark central band that also runs into the hind wing. Also, the leading edge of the wing is very slightly pinkish in most individuals. So worth keeping an eye out for that. But the two species I've really wanted to concentrate on are ribboned wave and plain wave. And I do think that the plain wave is probably an over-recorded species. So I just want to make sure that you're getting those to identify correctly. Obviously, the ribboned wave, as in the one with the decent band on it, the, the, um, the, the remutator form of it, is, is obvious. And that's fine. We can all get that right. But it's when we've got this rather plainer form at the top of a ribboned wave, how are we going to tell that from main wave? Well, let's just get rid of my annotations. Link on the side, and then go down here. Right. Move this one up the car. The, the, there is a color difference. The ribboned wave, when it's in a really good uh, condition, tends to be a little bit dirtier, dirtier, creamy, creamy white. So it's always a hint of brownishness to it. And the um the 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 plain wave is a is a is a much more even creamy color with these lovely little um upper flakes on it on, on both species. But the the key distinguishing features, and there are two of them, firstly it's the the um subterminal line, would you call it the line before the outer edge of the wing? where it comes away from the leading edge of the wing has got a distinct pink in it in a ribboned wave that is a nice curve in the plain wave. Oh, that makes it easy, doesn't it? But you can also confirm it by looking to see if the rib, if this wave that you want to identify has got dots on the outer edge of the dark line that runs along the outer edge of the wing. And if it doesn't have dots, it's plain wave. And if it does have dots, it's ribbon wave. So a combination of those two characters will get that right every time. Plain wave, at least in my part of the world, I think more of a grub heathland species, a mature oak woodland species. And in my experience, hardly ever moves from that habitat. So ribbon wave is really common widespread species, urban areas, woodlands, meadows, woodlands, find it all over the place. Plain wave is, is much restricted to sandy soils and to uh, ancient woodlands and, um, and scrub on, on heathland, that, those sorts of areas. Okay. Right, I will do one more slide. Happy for me to do one more slide, Rebecca, you think that's all good? Yep, keep going. Keep going. Excellent. Okay, we'll keep going. People are happy, are they? Fine. Okay. Oh, yeah. Look, okay. Look, we will go through this. We're going to be another mm, eight minutes. Okay, folks, eight minutes. Because I really want to do this lot. Um, willow beauty, mottled beauty, and satin beauty. Just because there's some nice key features here. Let's turn to satin beauty first on the right hand side. Satin beauty is a species that's uh, spreading pretty fast in Britain. Um, it's uh, it, it's difficult to know why, but it's just one of those species that's um, very definitely increasing in abundance and range. It's now found throughout Britain and is very definitely on the increase. That top right example is exceptional. I don't know about you, but if those of you who know Satin Beauty, if you ever see one like that, you will grab a photograph of it because almost all the satin beauties that I see look like that one in the hand down below. They're always scratted. I think they must spend, as soon as they hatch from their pupa, they must spend their time just flapping around in the in conifer and deciduous vegetation, just rubbing themselves to pieces. And so they end up this rather matte, even scratted look to the moth. But they do tend to sit just as it is in that picture. They sit almost butterfly-like with the antennae out and the wings slightly splayed and, and will happily sit on your hand. 
I don't know, but I've never really had a willow beauty or indeed a mottled beauty sit on my hand like that. So there's something really quite nice about a, a, a tatty or willow uh, satin beauty is that um, is that they're 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 quite um, quite human friendly. But it's a lovely moth. It's got broad wings, rather broader than willow beauty and mottled beauty. But uh, otherwise, it, it's it's you know, particularly when it gets to this very scratched and rubbed examples, it's quite indistinguishable from the others on on markings but the way it sits um is usually the characteristic for telling it apart so what about willow beauty and mottled beauty well um for willow beauty um i think the feature that i like to use is do you see the um the, the outer and inner lines uh, in the middle of the wing so here's the inner line it's coming down here and here's the outer line. And as these lines come from the leading edge of the wing to the trailing edge, they converge. So if you look at that example in the bottom of the picture, and you kind of scurry your eyes to get this into there, you can pretty much see um, these lines converging. And you almost end up with an equal sign at the trailing edge of the wing. Compare that with mottled beauty and the lines are quite divergent so there's no hint of an equal sign on any of these and you think oh well that's okay mottled beauty tends to be more mottled than willow beauty it also in my part of the world tends to be more of a woodland species so willow beauty ubiquitous but when you get into scotland mottled beauty is everywhere and willow beauty is relatively relatively common, I think that's right, isn't it? Willow beauty up in Scotland. Oh, and it's, no, it's relatively rare in Scotland and mottled beauty is relatively common. Um, so, but in my part of the world, if I were to see in an urban garden in Weymouth, a mottled beauty, I'd be doing exceptionally well. Okay, but, you know, that's okay as a character, but does it always work and is it fine? The way to tell them apart easily, oh, sorry, mottled beauty, there are the, the amazing forms of mottled beauty that can occur in woodlands. Um, for those of you who are new to mothing, well, that is a wow moth to go and see. For those of you who put your moth traps out in central England in a nice ancient woodland, you will see the conversaria form, as it's known, of mottled beauty. It's an absolutely stunning moth in comparison with the other forms that there are. But just let's have a look at how we're going to tell mottled beauty from Willow Beauty. Well, like most things, there's often an underside character to look at. And when you look at, if you turn over your Willow Beauty in your clear plastic pot, you will see that the Willow Beauty has a wonderful pale square at the apex, which just isn't present on the Mottle Beauty. And it couldn't be simpler than that. It is just, well, I can say, it's always going to be there, but um, in my experience, it is the one key diagnostic feature that pretty much never fails for telling those species apart. Now, just as my last slide, this is my last slide. I'll put it in the slide. Great oak beauty and pale oak beauty, just because um, having described this equal sign in the willow beauty, it then of course turns up very nicely in great oak beauty and in pale oak beauty and you're going to tell me well how come you use it this character for willow beauty but you're not using it for these two well great oak beauty and pale oak beauty are that much bigger significantly bigger than, than willow beauty and i'll just give you the dimensions in a second but the key feature to tell great oak beauty and Pale oak beauty is actually not the forewings, because if you look at that, you could go, yeah, well, I suppose maybe the pale oak beauties are a bit paler and a bit more washed out. But what happens if you've got a washed out great oak beauty? You need to look at the hind wing, and it's the if you can see it, it's the it's the dot in the hind wing that tells you which species you've got. If you look at the shape of this dot. In the pale oak beauty below, you can see it's a ring with a pale center. If you look at the equivalent dot in the great oak beauty, it's just a dot, or it's a, a little sort of um, comma marking or a little fleck. 
Okay, so that is, if you can see it and it's still present, that's a good way of distinguishing great oak beauty from pale oak beauty. But as always, there is a neat way by looking at the undersides. And there we go. On the right hand side is pale oak beauty. Let's look at these images there we are. And you can see that the apex of the wing, pale oak beauty, it's it's either all clear or it's got some some little mottlings, darker mottlings. Where in great oak beauty, it's got a distinct dark wedge just in from the apex and a very clear um, a pale yellowy brown space. And sometimes that um, dark wedge in the great oak beauty joins on with the uh, lead at uh, the the um, outer edge of the wing, and so it makes a nice white. Oh, pale square, just as it is in Willow Beauty. Um, uh, so, so you should, on the basis of those two characters, be able to distinguish whether you've got Great Oak Beauty and Pale Oak Beauty. Great Oak Beauty is very definitely a species of um, sort of inland woodlands um, uh, in southern England, so central and southern England. It seems to be spreading a bit in Dorset, which is quite delightful. Um, so it is possible to see it in Dorset. But it's very much a sort of southeast England speciality, heading across to the Wye Valley and then up into central England and into the Lincolnshire woodlands. And I think it, and maybe there are some other work and maybe the odd Welsh record, but it's very definitely a sort of central central uh, England and southern England species. Pale Oak Beauty is not a dissimilar distribution, but rather more widespread. So it's uh, throughout the whole of East Anglia and uh, north of London and throughout the whole of southeast England and across into uh, into Dorset uh, and again into the Wye Valley. But neither species seems to stretch in any in any abundance much into Devon. There are some records for both species in Devon. So, but what I have given just at the top is um, the, uh, it's the wing length. Um, again, just so that you can distinguish just how great Great Oak Beauty and Pale Oak Beauty really are. Pale Oak Beauty and Great Oak Beauty, actually many of the examples are very similar sized, but every now and again, a Great Oak Beauty will produce something enormous. And it's not always the female. Sometimes you can find these really giant male Great Oak Beauties among them. And when you see something that's I don't know, a wing length 20, that's nearly three centimetres. And so when this moth is six centimetres wide, that is a massive, massive moth. So a wonderful, wonderful sight if you ever get a chance to see it. OK, look, I am going to end it there. Um, thank you so much. I guess there are probably quite a few comments that have come in along the line. Um, but I hope you found this um, uh, an instructive session. And thank you to Butterfly Conservation. Thank you to Megan. And to Rebecca and indeed all the photographers who kindly let me have their images to use for tonight.